All right, let's pray. Father, it's been good that we've seen um, your goodness to us and all the things that you supply. And it's been good that we see that the response you want from us is first to gladly receive everything you give with gratitude in our hearts and then to generously uh, give in the same way that you do. We want to freely receive from you all that you supply and then freely give. And we want to continue to press that into the corners to look at how that practically works itself out in our lives so that we are faithful in our use of resources, or in our, our wealth, and all of the good things you give us, and that we don't have our hearts distorted and warped by false guilt or by misguided attempts to, um, uh, to orient towards our, our wealth. We don't want to indulge. We don't want to stiff arm the gifts that you supply. And so help us. We need a lot of help. And so I pray that you'd come now for these that are here, for these that will watch on the video, that you would be with us, you'd be gracious to us, and you'd make us more like yourself. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well in the recent sessions, we've been looking at practically how does a life that seeks to treasure God by enjoying His gifts look? What does that actually look like on the ground? And we've been talking about rhythms of Godwardness, that there's times where we go directly to God, and then those orient us and, and, and uh, direct our lives, govern our affections, that, that gets us right, and then it sends us into the world with a kind of quality of devotion, a certain way of engaging with the reality that God supplies. Um, and then that our engagement with the world then sends us back to God with greater love, greater joy, greater delight. And then in the most recent sessions, we've been looking at wealth and, and what, what do we do with it? How do we handle it? How does, how does an emphasis on um, enjoying, receiving, focusing on the things of earth, how does that relate to generosity and self-denial and sacrifice? And so we've seen that wealth in the Bible is more than money. It's not just money. It's money is a measurement of all the things uh, that, uh, that it can purchase for us. That wealth is good. It's a blessing from God, but it's also dangerous. And, uh, and that glad-hearted reception should lead to open-handed giving. We have open hands, and so God fills them, and then we keep them open. We don't close. We keep them open so that then we can share with others. And in this session, or these next two sessions, I want us to think more carefully about what that giving looks like. Um, in, recent, in recent years, um, you'll hear people talk a lot about a wartime lifestyle. It's... Um, um, it's built on this idea that life is war, that, that the world that we live in is a world at war, that we wage war not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities, that Paul calls Timothy to wage the good warfare, that no soldier, he says, gets entangled in civilian pursuits, and therefore life is war, which means we want to live like life is war. But what does a, what does a wartime lifestyle actually look like in practice? That's what we want to talk about, but to kick us off, let me um, let me kind of uh, jump in with this quotation here, um, a little bit counterintuitive perhaps for this topic, but I hope it'll color how we, how we approach it. It's from Doug Wilson. He says, put your kids to bed secure, well-fed, and warm. Thank God for it from the low bottom of your heart, and then plot how to extend that wonderful grace to others. So there's a way, I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you can look at the things that you have and you can just feel so guilty. Like, I, how, how is it okay that I'm putting my kids to bed secure, well-fed, and warm? They're, they're so happy, and so many kids aren't. And one response would be to feel guilty about that. Another response would be this, to say, thank you, thank you. I want to receive this, God. This is a gift to me. It's a gift to my kids that they're going to bed this way. And now I want to go dream and plot. How do we get this to more people? How do others get to join us in this tremendous gift of security and full bellies and warm beds. So with that, let's, let's dive in. What do we mean by a wartime lifestyle? Well, John Piper, I think, in recent years has been the, the most uh, uh, forceful popularizer, popularizer of it, and this is what he says. In wartime, we spend money differently. So if we're in a war, spiritual war, kingdom of God, kingdom of darkness, and, and it's a fight. In wartime, we spend money differently. There's austerity, not for its own sake, but because there are more strategic, that's a key word, strategic ways to spend money than on new tires at home. The war effort touches everybody. We all cut back. The luxury liner becomes a troop car uh, carrier. And so he wants to say that 
Jesus presses us toward this wartime lifestyle so that we don't value simplicity for simplicity's sake, but we value wartime austerity for the sake of the front. We want, we want the, our resources to be devoted to the front, to where they're strategic. What's the strategic use of our resources? We want to sell our possessions and give to the poor. We talked about that a little bit in the last session. We, want to, uh, we don't want to seek what you're to eat, what you're to drink. We don't want to be worried or anxious. The, the nations worry about those things. We seek the kingdom. We devote our resources to the kingdom, and God supplies for all of our needs. And so this is, this is, a, this is an interesting metaphor. And what I want to do um, is press into it. I think it's helpful. I think it's a helpful metaphor, but I think it can go wrong. In fact, I know it can go wrong because it, it went wrong in my heart. So let me, let me put it simply like this. I think... There's a way of embracing a strategic wartime lifestyle that actually undermines big-hearted, open-handed generosity and harms deep, Christ-honoring, life-giving relationships. Okay? So no, I, I don't mean that there's a problem with the metaphor itself. That we, I think we really are in a war, and I think we really ought to think wartime about how we use the things that God gives us. But I think there's ways that that can go funny in the soul and it messes you up, and it messes your family up, and it messes your relationships up, and it creates all kinds of problems. So I've seen it in my own life, and so for this session, or these two sessions, I think we'll, this is mainly gonna be a little bit of autobiography. I'll use myself as the, the key example because I've got plenty of terrible stories um, about things that I've done. Um, and uh, I'm fully aware that my struggles aren't everybody's struggles. Like, this is, this is coming from where I sit. Um, and that's okay. If your temptations are different, well, thank God that they're not like mine, and hopefully the Lord will help you to resist yours. Um, but, but I think there are others who are probably enough like me or who have to deal with people who are more like me, and so hopefully this can encourage corrective and also patience. So here's, here's how I want to begin with this wartime metaphor. Should we feel guilty? Should we feel guilt for being born in America? So here's, here's the scenario, okay? I'm talking about myself. I was born in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. Middle-class family, West Texas. I attended quality, non-religious, private elementary school, made my way through a great public school system with good teachers who taught me reading and writing and arithmetic. I had loving parents. They, they, they brought me to church. They coached baseball teams. They encouraged excellence in whatever I pursued. My early years were largely delightful. I made good grades. I played sports, had good friends, stayed out of trouble for the most part, okay? Uh, when, I, when I was 16, my parents bought me a, a car. It was a Toyota that was older than I was. Um, and then when I, was, uh, when I graduated, I'd, I'd made good grades, and my parents rewarded me by giving me an upgrade. I, I was able to buy a truck before I went off to college at Texas A&M University. I've always had food on my plate. I've always had a roof over my head. And I've been showered with blessings and opportunities and gifts at every turn. That's my life. That's where I'm coming from on this. Now, here's a question. Or actually, here's the second part of this scenario. I live in a world in which there are other children who are orphaned, abused, starved, thrown into unfathomably awful situations. That's the world we live in. There are people with no access to the gospel or quality education, potable water, indoor plumbing, healthy meals, a thousand other blessings that I just take for granted. They're just part of the furniture of my life. And so given that, given that disparity between the way that I was raised, the context I was put in, and the context that so many are thrust into, what, what should be my first response? Not my only response. What should be the first response that I should have to the fact that I've received all of this and I know that I live in a world where so many didn't? That's my question. Here's my answer. I think my first response ought to be gratitude. Unbridled gratitude. Abounding and overflowing thanksgiving. That's the first response. Not the only. Not guilt. Not guilt that I was born in America to those parents and other people weren't. Not shame. Not self-reproach. Oh gosh, I'm so awful for having been born in the West or I've had the opportunities that I did. And the reason, the reason I think that that's the first response is threefold. Three reasons. Number one, Paul tells us to give thanks always and for everything. Ephesians 5.20. Give thanks always and for everything. Were you born in Dallas? Give thanks. Were you born in Calcutta? Give thanks. 
Were you born rich? Be thankful. Were you born poor? Be thankful. Have your sufferings and challenges been relatively minor? Give thanks. Have they been heartbreaking and terrible? Give thanks. Now, I'm not saying that's easy, and I'm not trying to be glib at all, but if shipwrecked, beat up, left for dead, persecuted in every town, falsely imprisoned, tortured, Apostle Paul, if he can say, give thanks always and for everything, and so can we. And so can we. That's, that's reason number one. Paul commands it. What have I been given? Okay, I've been given all of this. What should I do? Say thank you. Give thanks always and for everything. Second reason why I think gratitude is the fundamental, the first response to the blessings God's given me is I didn't choose the place of my birth or the family I was born into or the gazillion other opportunities that just thrust themselves in front of me over the years. God determines, Acts 17, 26, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined, God did that, God determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. So why did I get born here? Well, God said so. God put me in that family, which means for me to feel guilty about being put in that family or in that context or in that country or in that socioeconomic status, for me to feel guilty is really to say something about his wisdom, okay? It's to say, um, you didn't really know what you were doing because if you knew what you were doing, you wouldn't have given me all of this. And so I shouldn't feel guilt. Jesus didn't die on the cross to deliver me from the sin of being born an American. Being a Christian in the West doesn't give us license to live worldly, but, but, the Bible does banish all false guilt over what we can't control, what God did. God just did it. And so what should we do with what God did? We should say, thank you. We don't boast at the gifts, but we don't grovel, we don't mope either. We reach down deep, we marvel at his kindness, and then we move forward in obedience to his word. That's the second reason I think first response is gratitude. Third, Paul, in this amazing passage, says that there's a secret to facing plenty and abundance. I don't know if you ever noticed this. This passage gets put on posters and bumper stickers and things like that. But Philippians 4.11, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Whatever situation. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, circumstance, I have learned the secret, notice that there's a secret, of facing plenty and hunger. Abundance goes with that, and need goes with that. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So we often, that, that passage often gets pulled out in hard situations. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's true, right? There's hunger, need, brought low, you need Christ to strengthen you, but we're on a, we, we don't always think about, like, we need help to face plenty. We need lots of help to face plenty. It's not easy to face affluence every day of your life without committing idolatry or succumbing to ingratitude. Like, that's not easy. In fact, here's the, here's the thing. I bet if I, if I said to, to you, all of you here, um, can you give me examples that you know of from church history of people who have faced unfathomably hard situations and yet have held on to Christ in the midst of it? Like, could you give me examples? Could you give me names of saints that you know of from history who have gone through unfathomable loss and pain and suffering and hardship and have held on to, with Christ honoring joy and faithfulness? Could you give me names? And I bet all of you could give me names. You could just start, boom, boom, boom. Now, what if I said, can you give me names of Christians who have received overwhelming abundance, provision, plenty, wealth, can you give me lots of names from church history of people who've done that and stayed faithful to Christ? You have just lists of people in the back of your head of, of Christians who've received a, just an avalanche of wealth and who have not made shipwreck. Why? Why is that? Because there's a secret. There's a secret to facing plenty. It's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so one of the chief challenges for us in the West is to learn to face our unprecedented abundance 
with the strength supplied by Christ and not by the wealth. We've got to be able to receive the wealth but not trust in the wealth. And it's hard not to trust in the wealth because it's always there and always calling us and always luring us. So there's a secret. So I remember um, this sort of thing, this, this idea that what should we do with the gifts God supplies? Fundamental response, gratitude. Because the Bible commands it, because I didn't choose what gifts I was given, and because there's a secret to facing plenty, to, to relying on Christ and trusting in Christ and, and doing things through him who strengthens me in the midst of plenty. Um, that came home to us when, when we were early on in our marriage, um, we struggled with infertility. And uh, doctors weren't sure we'd be able to have children. It was deeply personal. We went through years of um, prayers and hardship and wanting to have kids and being unable to. And so we, we had to, in, the, in those years, learn to face uh, hunger and need and being brought low by saying Christ is enough. And then when God graciously gave us our first son, we discovered we weren't nearly as ready to like enjoy this. Um, well, I remember one time we were, my wife and I were talking in the midst of it and we kind of looked at each other and I don't remember which one of us said it, but it was something along the lines of, you know, I feel like I've really been prepared well to suffer. Like, I feel like Lord gives, Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's just in my bones. I'm not sure I know how to receive a good gift in such a way that I honor God for it. Like, I don't know really what that looks like. I don't know if I've ever thought deeply and worked that into my bones in the same way. And so um, the point is that receiving good things rightly is hard. It's not easy. It's difficult. It requires grace. It, it requires, requires strength requires Christ. And so we want to be able to face life in an affluent society in a way that honors God above the wealth and honors God in the wealth and through the wealth. And that's not easy. So that's the first kind of anecdote is here's where I'm coming from and what's my fundamental response? Not my only, but my first. Now let me talk about then um, some anecdotes about wh where wartime went wrong. So I, I, I got into the wartime thing in college. I think where a lot of people get get into it for some reason. Um, when I first heard it, it just totally resonated. I said, yes, radical wartime lifestyle, that's what I want. I want to live that way. I wanted to live for his kingdom. I wanted to use the limited resources I had as a college student for God's purposes. And so I, I lived on the cheap. Like, um, I, we got extra roommates. Like, we had like four bedrooms and like 15 guys. I don't know. It was crazy. Um, we, uh, we had no, you know, no fancy clothes, no expensive furniture, like if we could, it, where did we get our stuff? Side of the road, you know, oh, there's a couch. We can use that. Um, I ate lots of ramen noodles. Um, cost of living was just way, way down there. Now, so I, I thought, hey, that's wartime, right? I'm being, I'm being resourceful in these use of resources. I'm using them strategically for the kingdom, right? Here's the thing, though. None of that was hard. None of it. Because I didn't, I didn't want any of those things. I didn't want to wear expensive clothes. I liked all the roommates. I think ramen noodles are pretty tasty. So, so here's the thing. Wartime lifestyle wasn't really a sacrifice for me, was it? Um, but what, here's what the wartime metaphor did. It did give kind of a biblical oomph to lifestyle decisions I would have made anyway. And it allowed me to then look around at other people who weren't making those same decisions and say, huh, I guess you don't really, you're not really for the kingdom, are you? My satisfaction in my so-called wartime lifestyle was far out of proportion to the sacrifice it was for me. So um, giving up things that you don't want anyway is pretty easy. That's not a hard thing to do. And it's a minefield of pride and smugness. So now look, okay, I, so I was supporting the church. I was, do, I, was, I was actually using wealth in ways that you want to. I wasn't just hoarding it. Um, I was generous when I had the opportunity but there was something ugly that got hatched in my soul during those years. Like just, it warped its way in there. It said, the main thing about wartime is, what are you giving up? And, and the funny thing was, um, it, it wasn't, uh, it was very selective. Um, so, you know, I wore clothes till they wore out, ate inexpensive meals, avoided extravagant spending on everything else, except for one thing. Okay? There's one thing that I spent money on. You want to, I wonder if you can guess what it is. Books books, right? I'm a professor, right? Now I'm a professor. There's books. I loved books. I love to buy books. Still love to buy books. Uh, when the Amazon guy comes to the one, the guy brings the Amazon box to the door. It's just a happy time <laughs> in my house. 
And here's the thing. I justified my book budget in wartime terms, right? Because I thought, I'm not spending money on all that extravagant, luxurious stuff. I'm not frittering my, my, my wealth away there. Um, so I'm free to go crazy when it comes to my book budget. And uh, so, so here's the thing. So I'm giving up things that I don't really want, and I'm purchasing the things that I still really want, but wartime is a way for me to justify my purchases and make me feel good about the things that I'm giving up that I don't want anyway. That can, that's awfully convenient, isn't it? Um, I mean, this, I, mean I, th- I thought, this is spiritually strategic, right? I mean, are you gonna, who's going to say? Who's going to, you know, somebody's, hey, is that strategic purchase? Are you going to tell me that Owen's mortification of sin is not strategic? That's not wartime. My fight with sin is not wartime? Come on. Like, I was ready. I had arguments. Um, and, and here's the thing. I think I was probably right. Like, I think that was a strategic use of my resources. I think that was a good use of what I did. I read the books. I was helped by them. But if someone else had chosen to make a different decision, like they thought it's more strategic for me to buy healthier food, (laughs) not ramen noodles, or I'm going to get a couch from somewhere beside the side of the road. Like if they had made that decision, I would have said, oh, I see, I see. You don't really care about the kingdom, I guess. So I'm exempting spiritual purchases that I did want giving up things I didn't want, and then I was using my own subjective preferences to subtly judge others who made different decisions. You see how wartime can go wrong? And it was all in the name of wartime. That was what did it. And so we don't want to judge others. What, what, so the question we have to ask is, what are we giving up, and what are we exempting from the call to be austere, to be strategic? And we want to avoid um, subjective impressions. So... Um, so that was the first thing, is, is uh, what are we giving up, what are we exempting, and, and how subjective is it? Is it just based on our personal preferences? That was, that was how it went wrong. Then uh, when, I got, when I got married, s- second little anecdote here, um, my wife and I first got married, we moved to Minneapolis, and uh, we're living in a basement in Minneapolis in the winter. Like the sun um, comes up at like 8 o'clock. So it's dark when you go to work, and it goes down at like 5 o'clock in the winter. So it's dark, and it's dark, and it's just always, it's bad. It's really bad. Um, we were from Texas, and so, of course, that was un- highly unpleasant for us. Um, and I'm going off to work. I'm, going, I'm doing an apprenticeship at, uh, at a church, and it's just great because I'm loving it. It's like exactly what I want. And my poor wife's at home um, in this basement, you know, all day long. And it's just hard. It's hard to be away from your family. And so... Um, and so a lot of our arguments in those early years, we didn't have a lot of money, were about money. That's what we just fight about. What, what, how, I don't know if that's strategic. It's wartime, right? And so I didn't understand. So um, my wife would always want to buy candles for our apartment, our little basement. And I'm thinking, 21st century, we got lights. Like, what do we need candles for? Um, this doesn't make any, any sense to me at all. Our, our candles really, like, we don't have a lot of funds. Are candles a strategic wartime pur- purchase when there are light bulbs available to us? I don't, I don't get it. Aren't they, isn't this superfluous? This is unnecessary. This is just a luxury. Come on. That's, that's, that was my attitude. So, I, so um, that was my attitude. We had a couple disagreements about this. And then one time I was in a, a ministry seminar with one of our pastors. And it was Pastor Sam. And we're going around the room introducing ourselves. And it's my turn. I said, well, uh, my name's Joe. Uh, I'm from Texas. I've been married for about a month. And it's been really great. Uh, you know, I uh, still haven't quite figured out why candles are so important. But uh, we're working on it. Chuckle, chuckle, ha, ha, right? And Pastor Sam looked back deadpan and goes, you don't know why candles are important? And I was like, oh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I don't. He looked back at me, he looked me right in the eye, and he goes, because she is. Right, just bomb goes off in your soul like, oh, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? Now, so, that may, so some people, that's obvious. That's like, well, of course, that's the reason. But to me, it wasn't obvious. I thought, I think if you would have floated the principle to me, I would have said, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. But it hadn't landed on me. So why are candles important? Why are candles important? Because they're strategic. Wartime means strategic. It means we use our resources in ways that are strategic. But, but what does strategic mean, right? Well, strategic means advancement of kingdom. It means expansion of gospel. It means spreading a passion for God's supremacy in all things for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. Wartime means strategic. Well, which means money exists for people. Money, that's what, that's what strategic, that's what, that's what the money's for. That's what the wealth is for. It's for people. It's to meet their needs. Spiritual needs, 
physical needs, emotional needs, and not just sort of abstract people. Like, I love people. It's persons, it's, it's the actual, you know, the, ones that, the, the people who are in front of me I can't stand. Um, real persons, names, faces, needs that are right there in front of you, like a wife who's saying, I, you just drug me all the way across the country, stuck me in the middle of winter in Minnesota, and all I want is some candles to make me feel a little bit more homey here. And you're going to fight me about that? Some reason I had grown accustomed to thinking of war times in terms of what I was going without instead of thinking of it in terms of what am I using it for? What am I using it for? I had a very truncated and narrow view of what wealth was for. A healthy marriage is strategic. An honored and happy wife, strategic. For kingdom, Warm, welcoming home so that people come in and feel like they can sit down and put up their feet and, and feel welcomed, that's strategic. Strong relationships with those close to you, that's strategic. And if the cost to help foster that strong relationship is a few candles, that's, that's a pretty low price to pay in my book. It wasn't at the time, but God was gracious. So wartime means, means strategic. And so Wartime means we divert resources from normal things so they can be used where they're most needed. And at that season in my life, where were they most needed? They were needed for candles. We, know, we often think about it frontier missionaries. That's true. I don't want to take anything away from that. But that's not the only place. The front includes, when we, when we send our resources to the front, that includes people and relationships right in front of us. Family is part of the front. That's your front if we're parents, children are part of the front. God wants us to raise them up in the Lord. Tell, show them what God's like. How? By being lavish the way he's lavish with you. Shower them, right? Parents are called, as we saw in the last session, gladly spend and be spent for their souls. That's what parents are for in kids' lives. Jesus says, um, evil men know how to give good, give good gifts to their children. Evil men know how to do that. You being evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more should good men, redeemed men, godly men know how to give, give good gifts to their children? And good gifts doesn't mean expensive, okay? I'm not talking about price tag here. I'm talking about thoughtful. I'm talking about I know my kids. I know them well enough. I know the sorts of things that they love. I know what gets their imagination going. I know what makes their heart sore. I'm gonna get a gift that does that. Why? Because that's what God does for me every single day day. It's what he's like. So we, so we want to show children or wife or friends, what's God like? He's lavish, right? Remember the garden. We talked about this a few sessions ago, right? Here's, here's all the trees. They're all for you. Eat from every one. I command you, eat from every one. Okay, how do we communicate that to people? Is that what comes through? Or what, what comes through is I've got, I know how to pinch pennies, We should be lavish with hugs and kisses and affection and lavish with praise and delight and mac and cheese and cookies and ice cream. And when it's their birth birthday, we give thoughtful, personalized gifts that show we're paying attention to you. I know what you need before you ask. I know what you love before you know what you love. I'm going to surprise you with joy. That's, what, that's the kind of parents we are. So we ought to buy those kind of gifts and give such gifts because that's strategic. That's wartime in your house. So again, I'm not, I'm not calling for increased spending on toys. This isn't just you know, blow the toy budget through the roof. It, but it is, make sure that there's a qualitative feel to your giving. Because people know, people know when there's a hitch in your giving. When you're giving, but there's that look on your face like, I hope you know how much this cost me. People know when you're saying, here, I'm giving this to you, but I'm gonna hold it over your head and make you feel guilty. People pick up on that, and God's not like that at all. That sort of reluctant, guilt-ridden, gift-giving harms relationship. It wrecks things. It's not strategic in the long run. Generosity with family, generosity with kids, generosity with those we know is a way to create people who are generous themselves. That feels good to receive good things. I want to be a part of extending that to others. I wanna put my kids warm and well-fed to bed, and then... How do, I do, how do I be like that? How do I extend that? That's what we're aiming for. Proverbs, Proverbs uh, mentions this hitch in, in the giving. Proverbs 23, 6. Scary text to me. 
because I, I feel it in my heart. I know how prone I am to this. Don't, do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. In, in the, it's literally a man whose eye is evil. A man with an evil eye. Don't eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his de- delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating. How much does that cost? Oh, we got him ice cream this time. How much does that cost? It's just on your face. They read it. Eat and drink, right? Have the ice cream. But his heart is not with you. How tragic. How tragic when that kind of heart is not with you generosity takes up residence in a Christian home under the banner of a wartime lifestyle. So, wartime can, can go wrong. It went wrong. God's gracious. It doesn't have to stay wrong. And with that, highlighting, so if, if, we, if we begin to think family's part of the front, not just frontier missionaries, they are, but now we've got a tension, okay? Well, how much should go to the family and how much should go to the frontier missionaries? How do we navigate that? The Bible give us any guidance? I think it does. Um, we've got varying responsibilities. You've got children and family. You've got church. You've got local poor, local unbelievers, frontier missions. You've got all these sort of different needs and limited resources. So how do we think about it? I think that the Bible teaches us to think in terms of concentric levels of responsibility. Meaning, so you've got concentric circles. So you've got an inner circle, and then you've got an, a circle, and a circle, and a circle, and a circle. And it works from the inside out. Starts in, and it works out. So let's start with that. First obligation, priority of the family. First Timothy 5.8, Paul says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially members of his household, he is denied the faith. And he's worse than an unbeliever. That's amazing. You don't meet the needs. I don't think it just means, oh, they've got bread and water. They're good. I think it means... Um, Provision means what kind of provision does God give? How many of your needs does God look after? How, 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 is he just thinking about bare necessities or is he thinking what are their real needs, their heart needs, their spiritual needs, their emotional needs, their physical needs, all of that, all that wrapped up together. God's thinking about, he's providing that richly, the Bible says. And then it says, if anyone doesn't do that for relatives, especially the ones who live under your roof, you've denied the faith. You're worse than an un believer. Why? Because our faith is built on a God who brings people into his household and takes care of them. And so if we don't take care of those under our roof, we're telling lies about God. He's denying the faith. Look, what's God like? Well, if he's like that family, I don't want anything to do with it. So, head of household has, I think the implication of this especially here means there's a greater obligation on me, say, as the head of the household, to provide for my family. I have a greater obligation to provide for my family than you do. Okay? I have a greater obligation to provide for my family than you do. I think that's what Paul says. In fact, that's the prerequisite for leadership in the church. If you don't know how to manage your own household well, you can't be an elder. Why? Because we want to be faithful in little, right? God gives you a little bit of responsibility. There's, like, there's, like, there's three people. There's your wife and two kids in my family. Make sure you take care of them. Let's start with, can you take care of that? Then let's see if you can be put over much. So first is obligation of family. That's first inside circle. Then we work out obligation to the local church. As we have opportunity, Galatians 6.10, let us do good to everyone, and then notice, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So there's an obligation in some measure, do good every chance you get it, but there's an especially. And especially, there's a special obligation you have to other Christians to care for the needs of the household of faith. And you can see how this is flowing right out of the last one, right? If you don't know how to take care of the needs of, if you don't take care of the needs of your biological or uh, familial household, okay, you're not qualified to take care of this household. That's the next level up is the household of faith. John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love, not for them, not for the all people, for one another. They'll know you're Christians by your love for each other. They'll look at that and they'll say, that's amazing what they do for each other. I don't have people who do that for me. 
who are willing to go that extra mile. So we have obligations. Love, care, and provision of Christians for other Christians is a powerful testimony to the gospel. So family, church, local needs. This is what the Good Samaritan parable is all about, right? So um, Jesus, in, in that, who's my neighbor, okay? And his, part of the point is everybody's your neighbor. But really the, the main point is who's near you? Proximity is part of the point of that parable, right? Jesus isn't rebuking uh, the Levite who, you know, they're down in uh, it's the road to Jericho, right? So that's in the south, that's in Judah. And then you've got Galilee in the north. Jesus isn't going, you know, that, that uh, Levite who was sitting in his house in Galilee, what a crook for not helping that guy on the road to Jericho. What do you mean? He's, he didn't even know about it. Who gets condemned? The guy who walks by on the other side of the road. Because he was there. The Samaritans commended because he was there and he did something. So proximity matters, local needs. What's, what, what did God put in front of your face? What are the needs? This is, this is the same principle, right? He, well, he put these kids and this wife in front of my face, so I'm gonna take care of them. And he put this church in front of me, so I'm gonna do my best to help take care of them. And then I'm going down the street in my town, and he put that need in front of me. He, he put my neighbors in front of me. And he said, take care of them. Do good to them. Love your neighbor. Proverbs 17, 24 the discerning sets his face toward wisdom. Just think about the contrast here. So discerning sets his face toward wisdom, but eyes of the fool are on the ends of the earth. Eyes of the fool are on the ends of the earth. What does that mean? I, th I think what it means is that there's a way of obsessing about the horizon, right? Always going, man, if I was over there, just I can imagine all the, the godly things I'd be doing. <laughs> Like if I was a missionary, this is the kind of missionary I'd be. So I'm, I, you're just looking at the horizon, the ends of the earth going, gosh, if I was there, that's, that's what I'd be doing, just dreaming about all your feats of holiness and glory while neglecting clear and present obligations. Wisdom makes demands on you right where you are, like right in front of you, like the people in the next room. Wisdom says that's discerning. You want to be discerning? Set your face toward wisdom. Look right. Don't look at the ends of the earth first. Look what's in front of you. Who's around you? Are you being faithful there? That's what wisdom says. Honor your parents, like the ones in the next room. Run from the adulteress, as in the one beckoning from the recesses of the internet. Avoid companionships of fools, like the guys who hang out at the gym and make lewd jokes. God plants us in a place, and he gives us responsibility. Be faithful there. Uh, P.J. O'Rourke is a political satirist, writes lots of funny books, and um, he memorably put this. I think he summed this up pretty well. He said, everybody wants to save the world. No one wants to help mom with the dishes. Everybody wants to save, everybody dreams. I want to save the world. I'm going to make a difference. And then mom says, hey, can you come help me? I'm busy dreaming about my feats of glory on the other side of the globe. So we don't want to be like that. We want to Obligations work from the inside out, family to church to local needs, and then global needs. The Bible doesn't stop with local needs, it goes global. Paul in Romans 15, Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. So this is in and around Greece, hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, and they say we want to contribute to the needs of those saints across the world. So we're going to help Christians on the other side of the globe. And Romans 15, 20, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. And he's writing to the Romans to say, I want you to help me. I want you to help me to get to Spain because there's no gospel there and I need your help on my way to, to give me resources so I can go take the gospel there. So the gospel cares about global needs, inside and out. And, and Paul God calls some people to have a greater obligation here, right? So Paul gives up a family, right? He gives up the security of a local church. He doesn't have a local home that he can meet local needs so that he can go be this traveling missionary guy, not building on other people's foundation, but taking Christ where he's not been named. And then he says to others, help him, support him, be a sender. Be a sender. He enlists the aid of Christians everywhere in accomplishing the great Commission. So, th and I think he this this here is the necessary counterpart. So, um, the biblical obligation to be generous with what God gives starts at home, and it works its way out. 
starts at home and it works its way out. It really starts at home and it really works its way out because if, um, if it doesn't, it's not Christian, right? Matthew 5, 46. If you love those who love you, like you take care of the needs of your family, what reward do you have? Don't even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't the Gentiles do that? Like evil men know how to give good gifts to their kids. It takes redeemed men to say, there are kids on the other side of the world who don't know Jesus. I'm gonna do something about that. I'm gonna put my kids to bed warm and well-fed and I'm gonna do something about that. That's what the gospel does. Starts here, explodes out in a wealth of generosity. So Christian love and generosity must overflow our natural relationships. If our generosity doesn't spill the banks of our family and friends, it's not Christian. We're doing it wrong. That's why Jesus says, um, when you give a dinner, don't just invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or rich neighbors, lest they invite you and you be repaid. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Then you'll be blessed because they can't repay you. Okay? Now, this isn't a prohibition on never have meals with friends. Jesus, you know, a few weeks later has Passover with his disciples. He eats lots of meals with his friends. But he doesn't restrict his fellowship in that way. He says, it's going to start here. It's going to start with this group, and then it's just exploding out. I'm inviting everyone, highways and byways, bring them in. They can eat with me. I'll feed them. So we should throw wonderful banquets and parties and then invite unlikely people to join in our feasting. So this is, um, I don't want, so I want you to hear me right on this. In trying to put the focus on the front and starts at home, the front starts at home, I don't want you to think the front ends at home. As though if you just took care of your kids, you could check off your generosity box and be good. It doesn't. It starts there so that you can be faithful and little and then God will meet your needs so that you can do more than you can ever think. So, other ways that wartime went wrong. Um, so, uh, so back to, here's my story again. Um, after the rebuke in the seminar, things got a little bit better but not, um, not entirely better. Um, so, um, I was, it was good. I had a patient wife um, who helped me see where I was being short-sighted. So here's, here's, here's one. Um, I want to think in three dimensions about cost. I got real myopic about cost. Like, my bottom line question was, what, but what's the dollar sign next to it? That's all I cared about. And so one time, uh, we were looking to buy a desk for me, um, and I thought, okay, let's just go and get one of those particle board desks for like 30 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. And that's all I need. I don't need something fancy. And she was like, I don't think that's a good idea. I was like, why? We want to be worth it. We don't have a lot of money. Let's do that. Well, no, let's, let's go buy, she, she says, let's go, buy, let's go to this store and let's get World Market, let's get a $200 World Market desk. I said, no, we can get a $50 particle board desk. We're going back and forth. And she says, look, we could buy you a $50 particle board desk now. And in six months, we could buy you another one. And six months after that, we could buy you another one. Because that's what will happen to that desk. It will get broken. Those don't stand up. Or we could go and buy the $200 desk and give it to our grandkids. Okay? And all of a sudden it was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What? Oh, yeah. Like, wartime is strategic. Oftentimes, short-term thinking is often not very strategic, is it? I was thinking very short term. I was looking at cost. I wasn't thinking longevity. How long is that going to last? How many times am I going to have to replace this thing? Now, in saying that, I'm not, I'm not saying always buy the most expensive quality desk. I'm saying you, those are the things you have to weigh. You've got to think three-dimensionally. You've got to take in all the factors and not just bottom line the cost like I'm prone to. I wasn't thinking strategically enough. And, and the other point of this is, is different people can reach different godly conclusions on what to do in that situation. Somebody might say, you know what? We may have to replace it, but it's still the right decision for us. We're going to buy the $50 desk. Or someone could say that the quality desk is a better investment for us. So we can, we can wrestle with the complexities of this and come to different conclusions and we shouldn't judge each other because we land in a different spot. That's important. That's what's so wrong in my own heart. Here's another thing, value of beauty. I, I, my definition of strategic did not include uh, an appreciation for aesthetics and beauty. In fact, oftentimes if it looked attractive, 
Like if it was actually it looked quality, I thought I actually thought less of it because I was like, oh, it must be expensive. When that's not true at all, right? There's all sorts of stuff that's ugly and costs a lot of money. And there's things that are really nice looking but aren't expensive. You got a deal. There's on sale. And so if you, if you just write off anything that looks expensive simply because it looks that way, you might be, um, you might be not using your resources strategically. God made a beautiful world. He calls, uh, calls us to imitate him. The time and money that we spend in making a home attractive, making it inviting for visitors, this is really important for women, I think, to feel like, you know what, is it a strategic use of my resources to make this home feel like a home? So that when people come in, they feel like, I, I really just want to sit down and be here. It's the kind of house I want to live in. And to be freed to say, that's a good use of resources. That's strategic for kingdom. If, if you're having people in your home, if it's not just, hey, we have this nice living room, but nobody's allowed to touch it. We just, we have a little velvet rope and you can look at it on your way to the kitchen. Um, that's not good. That's not good. But if it's beautiful, attractive, inviting so that people can come in and sit down and gospel life together or evangelism or relationship can happen, that's, that's good. Um, being a better cook, making the food taste better, that's strategic. Especially make enough to share, that's strategic. Making good food for your family is strategic. Um, and that's true even if you factor in like the fact that beauty is temporary. Just think about it. Um, uh, the flowers of the field, their beauty is very temporary. The Bible talks about it all the time. It just fades. It's just like grass. It fades. And you know what? God still thinks, I'm going to do that every stinking day. Right? Every stinking day, I'm going to make those flowers just go boom, and then they're going to get thrown into the fire, get burned up. And the temporary nature of the beauty doesn't undermine its impact because what's the point? You can look at it and you can say, that's what we're like, all flesh. It's grass. All of our glory, just like the flower of the field. It just fades. It's a picture. It's a picture for us. So is the beauty that we often make in our homes. We put the flowers on the, on the kitchen table. A few days later, they wither. They die. You throw them away. Is that a good investment? Yeah. It's a reminder. Every day you walk by and you say, that's what I'm like. Life's a vapor. Don't waste it. There's strategic value in temporary beauty. Same goes for vocation, right? Plumbers, I don't know if you know this, plumbers are some of the most beautifying people in the world, right? They make the world a much lovelier place, right? Both in sight and smell. If, you, if you've ever visited a country that doesn't have plumbing and plumbers, you know plumbers are essential to a beautiful place. So this is vocation. Moms who change diapers, good music that play, that's excellently played, that beautifies the world, that calls people out of themselves. That's wartime. That's strategic. I think um, education. I'm a, I'm a professor. Is that strategic? Is that a good use of resources? I think so. How many books do you think C.S. Lewis had to read before he was qualified to write the Chronicles of Narnia? Like how many old books by lots of dead guys did he have to just soak in for years and years and years before he can grow up and say, I'm gonna write some books that show Christ through this lion that's gonna awaken person after person, kid after, how many people you think have come to know Jesus or have come to know the beauty of Jesus through those books? You think his education was wasted at Oxford, in Cambridge? I don't think so. That was a good use of resources, it was strategic, it's wartime. Um, I've already mentioned the role of appearances a little bit, um, but here, let me just, let me give you a scenario here on this one. Um, let's say you've got a rich, unbelieving uncle who drives like the newest model Lexus, the nicest one. And then, you know, it's a year later and he says, I'm going to get me a new one. Hey, nephew, you want my old car? And you're looking at it going, that ain't an old car. <laughs> it's a nice car. So he gives you the nice new Lexus. Now, one way of thinking about it is that looks wealthy. People are going to get the wrong idea. You got to sell it and buy the beater. Okay. Another side might say, you know what? That's a quality car. That's going to keep your family safe on the road. That's never going to wear out. You're going to drive that thing till it falls apart. So maybe it's a gift. Can you just receive the gift? Or, or think about this. If you receive the gift and immediately sell it and buy the beater, what's your uncle going to think? Does that matter? Does that factor in to the wartime use? Is he going to think, how, what, how ungrateful that was? He, I, he just used that car to get some money and wasted on missionaries, right? And now you've just put up a bigger barrier to the gospel instead of saying, thank you. This is going to be helpful. My kids are going to be safe in that car. 
Now, the point is not to resolve that. Like, I think you could go either way. Like, I think godly people could make different decisions. The point is, it's complicated. There's lots of factors, and godly people can come to different conclusions in coming to them. So, last few things here. Um, economics, I had to learn some economics. I know economics intimidates lots of people. It intimidated me for the longest time. I don't mean the stuff with like graphs and charts. I don't understand any of that. But there's simple sort of basic rules like tan stoffel, okay? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch, okay? You learn some economics. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Um, here's what that means. Somebody's going to pay for it. Somebody's going to pay for it. may not be you because you're wartime. Somebody's paying for it. So this is, here's the scenario. Um, you got a college student. He sells his car because he wants to support a missionary. And the cost of insurance and gas and everything else just meant he couldn't. So he sells the car, and now he's going to support the missionary. But what happens now? Well, he still needs a ride to class. So he bums a ride off his roommate all the time. Grocery store, class, even dates sometimes. It's really sad. Okay. It's always got to be, he's, hey, I need a ride. Hey, I need a ride. Hey, I need a ride. Now, what can happen in that relationship? Well, here's what can happen. The guy who gave up the car can say, I'm being wartime. I, gave, I sold my possessions, and I'm giving it to the front. Like Jesus said, my roommate, on the other hand, he kept his car. Well, yeah, he kept his car. He kept his car so that you guys could get to school. Right? Somebody, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Who's paying? Who's supporting that missionary? That's the question. Is it just the guy who sold the car? Or is it also the roommate who kept the car so that they could actually get around town? Who's really supporting? The, is this a joint effort or is this solo? I'd say it's solo. I mean, sorry, I'd say it's joint. <laughs> it's, it's a joint effort. They're both supporting that missionary, even though one of them is paying for the car and one of them is sending the money overseas. Here's another economic principle, value of time. There's lots of things that could be done more cheaply in terms of cost, if you have the time and energy to make them happen. Like you could sew, make your own clothes or you can grow your own food and all that kind of stuff. That's true. You can save a buck or two that way. But that's, but that's also a lot of time and effort. How much is your time worth? You think about that? Does that factor into wartime thinking? Like, yeah, I could go through a ton of effort to try to find the cheapest version of this or I could just pay whatever the price is to have them do it and I'd have lots more free time to be able to devote to other things that might be strategic for the kingdom. So how much is your time worth? That ought to factor into your wartime thinking. That's an economic principle. And finally, zero-sum world. This is what I mean. Zero-sum is simply this idea. Like Zero-sum would be like you got a piece of a pie. you got a big pie. And if it's a zero-sum pie, that means if I get a bigger piece, you get a smaller piece. My, pie, my piece gets bigger. Your pie piece must necessarily get smaller. Okay? And this is a trap. This is a false way of viewing the world. That's not the world God made. God's world is not a fixed piece of pie where if, 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 we, get, if we have more money, it means somebody else that must have less money someplace else. That's not how it works because wealth can be created. Right? We can creatively create wealth by mixing our creativity, by coming up with new ideas, by doing it better, by digging into the world God made, and we make the pie bigger. We expand the pie so that as our, pie, as our piece gets bigger, so does everybody else's. So don't think of the world as a zero-sum game. We can develop and produce amazing things. We can increase the total wealth and value in the world. That's what it means to bear God's image. We looked at that a few sessions ago. So to return and wrap it out, the main point of this session was to stress the complexity of living faithfully in a world of wealth. That's the main thing. I just want you to see how complicated it can be. I don't want to solve the problems. I want to say, look, there's lots of factors here, and we ought to have a lot of grace for each other as we seek to make wise decisions. Is it possible to abuse what I just said? Sure. You could hoard your wealth. You could sit on it. You could make it all about you. Um, but, but, sinful tendencies like that of indulgence and hoarding aren't addressed by going to the other extreme. Right? Self-denial is dangerous. Wartime is dangerous. It was for me anyway. So instead, here's the, here's the final exhortation. We want to become big-hearted receivers of all that God gives, and then we want to aim to be as generous as we can be with what he's given. We want to be as generous as he is with us. That's the goal. We want to imitate him. We want to um, seek to be open-handed receivers, open-handed givers. We want to, as I said before, freely receive 
and therefore freely give. Let's pray. Lord, uh, our fronts begin at home and our fronts end at the ends of the earth. And where we fit along that spectrum and where the proportion of our incomes go and our time and our effort, Lord, is up to you and in, in the calling you've placed on our lives. So put us where you want us. You, you plan us. You put us. You put everyone in this room in America for the moment. And you've given us things. You've lavished us with things beyond our imagining, beyond what we deserve for sure. And we want to receive it. We want to be grateful always and for everything. And then we want to plot and plan and dream and scheme about how we can extend these good things, especially the gospel, to those who don't have it. So help us to have that kind of heart, your kind of heart. Banish all false guilt. Banish all false twisting of truth, biblical things, so that we can grow up into your fullness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.